<laughs> Sorry, Paul. Paul the news of Clubhouse <laughs> sure, is, it, is this for my insights? Is it for my wit? Is it for my notification bump? Which, which is this for? If you have to ask, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm very happy to to let my followers know about this wonderful show any night of the week. Uh, well, Paul, I would say you know while we are waiting for uh, Javier, I would say thank you so much for jumping in for uh, one. You know, both the, the Bill Am one and the Tony Hawk one. I did not know that you were so into skateboarding until you know uh, the Tony Hawk show. <laughs> I didn't know Stephen was so into skateboarding. Yeah, I know. Daniel, why don't you pull that Javier up awesome. into the room? That was awesome. The um, well, I just grew up near. I grew up near the beach in San Diego, and here we go. Uh, and oh, everyone kind of, everyone kind of did that, you know. Um, yeah. And like Delmar Skate Ranch, like he was talking about, is like a mile from where I grew up. So that was that was so cool, Paul. It like, was so cool, was, Steven. You were an all star there. That was amazing. I, yeah. But but growing up on being able to go to those West Coast Coast parks. Uh, that would have been amazing. <laughs> that would have been amazing. Uh, Javier, can you hear? Can you hear us? I yeah. sure can, but I, I just don't want to interrupt a, a good conversation about Tony Hawk. <laughs> no, no I, we're uh, purely filler. We're purely filler. That, that, that's, that's, for you. I, I can't match up with that, Tony Hawk. Are you kidding me? Like that's that's way more interesting than uh, uh, he's got wit. He's got athleticism. He's got brand. What, I, geez, awesome. that, that is a tall order. Can you do a 900? No. Easy question. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I, uh, uh, do, do I wish I could? Maybe. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. We're a couple of minutes past the hour. Um, I think it's time to... Steven, hit the music. Live from San Francisco and here on Clubhouse, it's The Good Time Show, bringing you today in technology. And now your hosts, Artie and Sriram. Hey folks, welcome, welcome to tonight's show of the Good Time, uh, Good Time Show. Um, uh, this is Arti, and we have Shirami, Stephen Sanofsky, Paul's up on stage. Uh, Paul, this is totally for your wit, in case you were wondering. Uh, <laughs> I'll, good I'll thoughts. Down to the audience in a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, we've been doing this for a few months, and we generally cover, uh, you know, tech uh, products. We cover things around like movies, TV shows, culture, things like that. And uh, it's ge it's generally a lot of fun. We do it for an hour, pretty much every weekday night, tonight, Sunday night. And tonight, uh, we, you know, no exception, we have another awesome special guest. And I'll let Sriram introduce who that is. Awesome. You know, thank you. you know, when Stephen first suggested, I, mean, I was just so, so uh, excited. Uh, he's somebody whose work I have followed uh, for many, many, many years. Um, and, you know, I'll go through his background in just a bit. But I think, you know, uh, one of the things we're really excited to have this show is, you know, the thing which often we get asked about are uh, about people trying to figure out how to have a fantastic career in technology in Silicon Valley. We get mm -hmm. these questions about, do I do startups or do I do a big companies? Um, how do a startup work inside a big company? Uh, you know, how, how do the insights of some of these most interesting institutions look like? And there's all these kind of questions that we really get at it. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, one way Javier kind of represents, you know, uh, you know it, it, as somebody who's kind of been at the peak of all things technology for many, many years now, uh, his background is super fascinating because I think he's kind of done the tour of some of the most interesting uh, companies around. First up, uh, you know, he was at uh, Netscape, uh, which, uh, you know, if our friend Mark shows up, we can all uh, make, we have some jokes over there for sure. Uh, he spent a bunch of time at, uh, you know, um, VMware. But what we're really going to get into, I think, is his time with his uh, a company, which, by the way, uh, Javi will get into. I used a ton. You know, that was kind of my go-to email client yeah. both before and after the acquisition. I have so many thoughts and so many bugs that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> uh, I a lot of that. Uh, tell what we do here. To some other people. The bugs, the bugs go, to, go to a different place than me, but, uh, but yes. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about Microsoft Outlook, which, trust me, there is not a shortage of opinions on. Uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we are going to talk about the big, uh, the, 
the big D, uh, you know, um, uh, how he ha- ha- heads up a little done thing called Google Workspace, which honestly, I think I spend my time in almost every uh, single day. So from really, you know, uh, trivial questions like the future of work to really important questions like, can he tell about all the Google icons? We are going to get right into it. Um, um, but with Fini, uh, for, Javier, thank you so much for being on the show. It's such a pleasure. Sure. It's great to be here. Uh, awesome. So, so, you know, so maybe one quick place to start up with before you get into all the companies. You have just a fantastic background growing up in Puerto Rico. Just can you tell us about like, how did you find computers? How do you kind of, you know, get into tech as, you know, as the young person? Like, how, how did that story look like? Uh, you know, I don't remember exactly where the, the infatuation with computers began. It, it specifically, it, uh, other than to know that it began at a young age, Puerto Rico, you know, growing up in the early 80s was uh, somewhere between three, three to four years behind whatever was happening in technology in, in the U.S., and so either because I saw it on TV or because, you know, I was lucky enough to come across someone who had a computer of some kind, like it, 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 it was a slow, slow process, but I, it, it became a, a pretty significant part of my life ever since I was in grade school. I got my first computer at, uh, when I was in fifth grade, I guess, so probably what, 10 years old. Uh, uh, a Radio Shack Tandy Color Computer 2 for those keeping score at home with a whopping 16K of memory and not the original uh, Trash 80. This is like sort of Trash 80 uh, uh, slimline edition. Uh, but it came with that important thing where you where you have the switch that goes between computer and television to use it, right? I, I think so, yeah. Like instead of a monitor. I definitely didn't have a monitor. Uh, it, uh, and then this one, you know, the Trash 80 was such a, a popular and, and, and important computer, the silver one that did have a proper monitor integrated into it. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, this one was more, it was, it was Radio Shack's attempt to take on the Commodore 64, which I, I lusted after for years, never had, but, uh, uh, yeah, it, it began at that age and, and it really grew from that into eventually getting my first PC and mm-hmm. so forth. So. And, and I, I'm curious, right? Like it, 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 when you kind of uh, how did that, I think, like, what is kind of the internet computer scene like? Like, we, Arthi and I grew up in India, and, you know, we weren't, we were very far away geographically, culturally, from uh, Silicon Valley. But sometimes I think it can be helpful to kind of grow in a place far away from, you know, the SF Bay area. Uh, uh, you know, how was kind of the computer scene there? You know, do you get, like, a, have a group of people that you kind of connect to? How, how was that like for you growing up? It was actually, uh, uh, so certainly long before the internet was even a thing, right? Like I'm talking about the 1985, 86, uh, yeah. uh, when, I, when I first started getting into this. It, it was, if I, like, as I thought about it, what made it special. Actually, we call was, it Stephen Sehede is what they exactly. call it. Exactly. And now I get to relive <laughs> those moments because of Stephen's newsletter, which really deserves a plug. And, 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 and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, like, it is an amazing lens through which I can look at all the weird shit that has happened in my career and how lucky I've been to be able to live through the eyes of somebody who was there during that period of time in the 80s at Microsoft, this company whose products I was just beginning to be familiar with, uh, uh, you know, during that era when I first got my first PC and everything. Uh, um, that is and, called and, hardcore software on Substack, by the way. There you go. And, and, and uh, ask, for, ask for it by name. Um, so consuming those products on, you know, uh, uh, in a, it, uh, it's, it's it, it, a market that is uh, close enough to the United States to have ready access to the stuff. And certainly today, the, the technology scene in Puerto Rico is thriving and is not three to four years behind like it was back when I was growing up. Um, but it was a very small number of people who knew or cared about this subject. And as a kid growing up and having a passion for this, I would literally steal someone in my building. This is, this is me admitting to postal crime. This is bad. But you hear this clubhouse moment for everybody. Uh, somebody in my building received Computer Shopper back then. And the notion of having an, a sort of a giant coffee table book sized book full of computer related ads for me was like just I I I took it a couple of times. I, I am a, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it was just there were desperate times. And it was just a magazine full of ads. Let's not get ourselves. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so that was kind of how I got into it. And it became, I became more familiar with it, started reading magazines, but it was always experienced from a distant distance because I mean, I had a PC, but didn't really have, uh, it, obviously they weren't connected. I don't even know how stuff, how word got around. I was trying to explain this. I have a nine-year-old son and uh, we were talking about games or something. And I tried to explain to him how we would figure out difficult parts of the Sierra adventure games I'd play on a PC back then. And when there was no internet and no YouTube and no, none of this stuff, you'd have to buy hint books and, and, you know, the games came in beautiful colored boxes. It just seemed very strange. So it was a lot of that until all the way until college. So, uh, so yeah. college, you, uh, you skipped a few steps, but getting to college, but let's just, we'll, we'll keep going. Like, uh, you, you picked CMU to study computers. Like you knew that was what you were going to go do. No, no. See, I, uh, uh, uh I, I, I didn't, or you were going to be a real engineer. I, <laughs> I was going to be a bio, a genetic engineer. <laughs> I was there to study biology and genetics because when I was graduating or about to graduate from high school and I was thinking about what, what do I want to study and all of that and having that conversation with my parents and specifically with my dad, I believe the exact phrase he used when I told him when I considered going to school uh, uh, to do computer science was, and to be what, a programmer and the thunderous like this disdain with which that statement was uttered still uh uh, uh well it I've, I've kept it and i br bring it up every once in a while at, at holidays and, and other gatherings just to remind him of how how absolutely uh wise i was in not following that piece of advice but when i when i went to carnegie mellon i i uh i went in uh really with a passion for biology uh and study in genetics and and ultimately as my academic my illustrious academic early academic career at mm -hmm. Carnegie Mellon would, would show, and anyone who knows me knows this to be true. Uh, I, I had a passion for pretty much anything but that, right? So I, academics were not at the top of my list during my first go around at Carnegie Mellon. So, <laughs> But somehow but you, I, tripped, you, you yeah. tripped into the computer science department. Well, which is... I did because it was everywhere there, right? Like you show up, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I'd never seen the internet. So I go from like the best thing I knew was a maybe a, a 386 PC at the time, obviously not connected to anything, even though I might have heard about Nobel Netware by that point, but probably not. Uh, only reading about it in magazines. And I get to the school and, the, and I see that they had uh, 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 networking in the dorms. And I'm like, but for what? That is, they had something called Token Ring, which I'm sure Stephen remembers. Uh, uh, <laughs> So you could get a token ring card uh, for your uh, for your computer, or you could get in in the newer dorms. They were putting in something called Ethernet, and it wasn't until I connected the dots between this idea of like computers that were connected to each other, and then there, that there was also this, you know, in every lab where we had you know everything from like early Sun workstations to Deck five thousands to like uh, uh, next. Uh, uh, workstations and next cubes and stuff like that, they, that these computers were all connected to each other. They were connected to other schools. It was like, a, a, to describe it as a fire hose of, of things to, to wrap your head around uh, is, is an understatement. I saw Linux for the very first time in 1992 and installed it on my friend's- Well, that's uh, very PC. early. Yeah, and it was on, uh, uh, on floppies. Right. And uh, and we downloaded it from an FTP site. Uh, I think the one at uh, Wash U in St. Louis was a very popular one. I don't know if that was where we got the, the early Linux built from it. But you, but you could get like a Linux with X windows. This was mind blowing because we saw workstation class Linux or sorry, Unix experience on a on a PC. And then I didn't see it for many, many years uh, uh, after that until it became like a mainstream scene. So for me, the, my freshman year at Carnegie Mellon from 1992 to 1993 was like getting a preview of all of the cool, like every single thing that became mainstream part of people's lives, whether it was like, uh, uh, you know, things like marketplaces and auction houses like eBay. You know, mm -hmm. CMU had Usenet boards that were used for that purpose. Uh, uh, I mean, 
so many different things. Uh, uh, Zephyr well, Instant Messenger. But by timing wise, your freshman year, of course, is when the World Wide Web was starting too. Right. Right. So you're, right. you're like I didn't right. I see it until like maybe a year, right. the first graphical browser I saw maybe uh, two years, like uh, sophomore or junior year. Yeah, sophomore year would make make more sense, but there is a lot going on in pure computer science there that's kind of important. Yes. I mean, right, you're yes. right at the epicenter of this mock operating system that's taking over the world in some ways. Yep. I mean, uh, so, uh, mock had just come out in Next. That was why people were so interested in Next was because that was the 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 expression of of mock. Mm -hmm. That was the first commercial OS I think that had mock in it, or at least certainly the one yep. that people would be able to talk about in what what would pass as casual conversation at a place like Carnegie Mellon, which, well, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, but the two thoughts. First is, by the way, that era with Linux might be like probably right after Linux had his famous fight with Tannenbaum. So that's like really, really early uh, yep. you know, uh, for you to even have access to that. And, you know, Mark Andreessen, when he comes on the show, he often talks about the idea of a scene or a seniors where you're just part of a space where a lot of interesting things are happening at the right moment in time and you just get exposure to all these cross-cultural wins. Um, it's kind of very obvious that, you know, you've been in one for at the right moment, at the right set of people for technology. Uh, there have been others in arts and science. You know, for people listening in today, I think a lot of people are like, okay, well, how do I get some of that and you know one way is obviously you know you can probably go to a really interesting school another way might be you just hang out at the right spots on the internet but how does like somebody listening in maybe in their early 20s how do they get to be uh, the part of the right scene outside of you know maybe getting into a, a fantastic school you know the the challenge is that they're back then in, in the same way that when i was growing up in puerto rico being interested in computers required uh, a, a, you know, a certain amount of conviction to go seek out the information. It, it required, you know, me, me uh, occasionally borrowing computer shopper issues from uh, my neighbor who probably is still looking for them. Um, now, mm -hmm. the challenge is that there's so much uh, at ready access to communities, uh, 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 gatherings of, of interesting people. Like, I mean, whether it's online or even in physical, in the physical world, the amount of options and access that people have to explore this kind of stuff isn't the limiting factor. It's the quality of the exposure you get and whether you find it interesting or not, right? Like, because there's, you could be interested in a whole range of things about technology from robotics all the way to, I don't know, uh, language translation. I was, at the time that I was starting at CMU, I started getting interested in artificial intelligence and it was actually during the times where you could not talk about artificial intelligence without uh, uh, having to withstand a fair amount of mockery and, and disdain <laughs> from, uh, uh, from certainly from academics who are like, ooh, yeah, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we don't talk about that stuff here. That does, none that of that That was the AI works. winter. That yes. was the AI winter and all the professors yeah. had lost all their funding. And so they were sort wow. of trying to repurpose yeah. AI in some way. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that that whole time frame just sounds like very ancient to me because, I, you know, <laughs> I'm old and Stephen is that. older. That's that's, <laughs> a, that's the part that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, have you? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're you're graduating now. So, um, what what's like? What are you thought? What what are you thinking about first job at that time? You know, just getting out of CMU. You're looking around. A, you know, at that time, AI was not a thing. Right. Uh, so what's like, what was your thinking around uh, getting into the first job? So the plan, uh, uh, about uh, halfway through my junior year, I got really into uh, uh, finance also. Mm -hmm. This is at the sort of the dawn of, of uh, uh, you know, algorithmic trading. And, and uh, I got really interested in derivatives. And right. I just really dove uh, uh, really, really into that space. And CMU has a fantastic business school. And I found myself taking all kinds of courses in uh, uh, that combined uh, a traditional sort of uh, uh, financial analysis uh, uh, and, and, you know, typical sort of education around how to learn about different asset classes, et cetera, with technology and really all the way through this uh, emerging derivatives field. And on the way out, of college, the plan officially was that I'd go to New York 
uh, and work at, a, at an investment bank and in pursuit of a, a clearly misguided uh, uh, blend of both technology and business, I, I really thought that I could be both in the front office and the back office simultaneously. And as, a, as an internship at Merrill Lynch in 1995 quickly demonstrated you were either one or the other, like the people writing the algorithms and doing all the heavy lifting, the quants, if you will, weren't the ones, <laughs> at least back then, who were doing all the cool deals and meeting with people and uh, uh, you know, having all the interesting conversations. They were basically doing quant stuff in some, uh, in some room at World Financial Center South Tower, 14th floor. Like it, it was a very specific, uh, you were either in the business or you were supporting right. the business and all the technology people supported the business. So at that time, uh, even though I was pretty dead set on taking a, an offer uh, to go work in, in uh, New York, mm -hmm. I had a, uh, the most sort of serendipitous uh, interview with Netscape and uh, wow. I had no intention explicitly of uh, going to work and having a, uh, I didn't want to go work at a technology company. I don't know why that, I, mm -hmm. I can't really think of exactly what I had uh, that was holding me back from that. But I went and took an interview with Netscape anyway, actually, because uh, a friend of mine who had graduated the year before had come back on a recruiting trip and was like, hey, you know, what the hell? Like, worst case, we send you, we bring you out to California. You can, you'll like it out here. It'll be a cool trip. And I was mm -hmm. like, all right, well, that sounds good. And it was actually through that, uh, uh, by accepting that interview, uh, literally, in one trip, one recruiting trip uh, in November of 1997, uh, uh, that on the same day that I interviewed at Netscape, I met the woman who is now my wife and the mother of my two children. Wow. Uh, uh, so you're to talk That's about- That's amazing. Yeah, to be able to point at one moment, November 7th, 1997, uh, a very all encompassing kind of moment where uh, uh, it's like, hard right towards something different and it wound up being uh, uh and actually what's even better is i i met her out here in california she had also gone to carnegie mellon and also worked at netscape although the reason why we met had nothing to do with the, with with netscape for sure so mm -hmm. to, to have uh, uh had such a, a confluence i guess of of different events and and it it truly in in the time that I spent at Netscape interviewing, I was convinced that that was that was the job that I wanted. Like, uh, and it was actually not as a professional services person. I'm sorry, not as a software engineer, but instead as a professional services uh, 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 person working, you know, putting technology to work for customers. And that part I found really interesting. And it was early interest internet infrastructure stuff and browser stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, uh, um, and you I reported think... directly to Mark Andreessen for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What, he, is he on? Uh, uh, he, uh, he can no, answer I didn't think so. He was no, terrified no, of your Netscape story, I think. And so, you know, he just chickened out. That's what that's <laughs> yeah, uh, He and I have had many, many, many delightful asides uh, uh, about that and across my, my journey because I truly think that the opportunity that to, to have worked there, uh, it, as weird as it was in the way it came up and as powerful an event as it was when I interviewed mm -hmm. here and fell in love with California and met this woman and uh, uh, fell in love with her and really fell in love with the technology industry. Uh, um, it was such a bright, bright, awesome, awesome moment. And then uh, Netscape, when I joined, was, uh, uh, you know, on the back nine, so to speak. And even mm -hmm. though I'm not a golfer, I guess I'll try to use that term. Um, we they, Obviously, the company was public already, and uh, their their plan was to extend beyond obviously a browser business and into more back office mm -hmm. uh, uh, and infrastructure technology. And ironically, or maybe not ironically, email systems, mm -hmm. uh, Netscape messaging server, like all this backend stuff that uh, I was deploying uh, uh, when, when I first started there. And it was a really, really, really cool experience. It was just, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that that was my job. Um, mm -hmm. And the products we had, I mean, it, the amount of empathy I developed for customers of early stage software products through that experience mm -hmm. uh, uh, is unbounded because we were, you know, people were buying things they didn't really even understand. And Netscape was building products with good intentions, but like any other company, it's going through its own process of how to mature into being a true enterprise grade right. 
software company, operationally and technology wise. Uh, it, very valuable lessons throughout that. So, so, so one, you, were, you were in the thick of it right then, mm -hmm. like literally on the ground with customers um, making this stuff work. Yep. At a time yep. when yep. like it, it barely worked, like for the whole thing barely worked. You know, it's not like there was like internet shopping yet and a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, it was just like, hey, how do we get a website working and collaboration? I mean, yeah, that it, there was the beginnings of that. But yeah, all of, mm -hmm. a lot of what they were buying was uh, uh, moving to truly internet powered email. Um, web based email was some of the early things that we were deploying, even for internal customers. The, the, the one of the largest deployments I did back in that time was for Safeway. And uh, uh, what's awesome about that story is that we go through this thing where Safeway was moving off of Novell's then, this is like for the old, for the old folks on the call. Uh, uh, Group-wise. Um, yeah, exactly. Group <laughs> wow. The whole group was, and they were moving on. We had to convince them. We convinced them. We were competing heavily against Microsoft, who was trying to get them to uh, uh, adopt, uh, exchange, whatever version that would have been. And we convinced them instead to buy the Netscape infrastructure. And we also convinced them to buy this all in Unix equipment. So they, they, they were a clearly, they, if they could barely operate data centers, they were entirely a, a PC, you know, a, a Intel shop. But we said, no, 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 we can actually sell you stuff. And it's a lot better and more cost effective if you buy it you, on these beautiful purple and gray sun uh, uh, E500s or E600s, like these, these beautifully designed machines that we uh, 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 convince Safeway to buy. So they buy them. We do all mm -hmm. this stuff. We're getting ready to cut over. This is my, my, one of my earliest like big go live events as we would call them in my current job. And the CIO of Safeway is breathing down my neck. It's nighttime. We're out in like Pleasanton here in the East Bay. Uh, uh, I, and right as I'm about to basically flip the switch, I, I, I try to tell net to the machine and this for those keeping score at home. Yes. Yes. Tell net, not SSH. Uh, um, and I couldn't reach the machine because the machines were in some data center in, in, uh, uh, Provo, Utah or Salt Lake city. Anyway, I can't reach the machine. And the CIO is like, what's going on? What's going on? And I'm like, listen, man, I can't reach the machine. <laughs> Basically a couple of phone calls later, you find out that the reason I couldn't reach the machine was because at the data center, where some lonely Unisys individual was sitting there doing the night shift, uh, somebody had basically borrowed the power strip that these this this quarter million dollars worth of Sun hardware was connected <laughs> to like a $12 power strip from Walgreens and somebody needed it. And so they just unplugged our machines. And uh, at that point I turned back to the CIO and I said, hey man, uh, so your go live event here is uh, postponed due to the fact that you chose to wire this up to a $10 power strip that somebody needed. So uh, I'll mm -hmm. be back, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> just call me tomorrow. As so I came back the next day and we- uh, it, it uh, so, uh, so, so I love this story because I think, you know, one of the things we often get asked about is young people and how to think about their first jobs. And one thing kind of strikes yeah. me from that story is, number one, you kind of set this unfair expectation that you're going to find your life partner as a part of the process of finding one of your first <laughs> jobs. So, well, that's there. Uh, and so thank you, Mark and Reason for, for yes, setting that up. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I owe him that. You owe him what? Uh, yep. uh, you know, he may not have reduced my, my windows to a buggy set of device drivers, but he did find you a partner. So uh, he has that going for him. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, second, uh, the second part of it, I think it's just kind of great to hear, like, you know, somebody's story and how they started, um, because often we just kind of see how they've made it like a decade plus later. So I think your story is interesting. Okay. I want to quickly reset because then we want to get to, I would say, the second half of your career. But sure. that half the hour... Uh, for everybody listening in, uh, this is the Good Time Show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this has been like quite an interesting room. Um, uh, this is a show that Arthi and I do almost every single night. Um, we talk about uh, tech, and we have really often interesting people from the world of technology and culture. And we have somebody really interesting today, uh, Javier Soltero, uh, you know, uh, head of Google Workspace, uh, you know, uh, uh, used to you know, a, a multi-time founder, uh, and has Mark Andreessen to thank for getting married. So uh, interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Okay, so uh, Javier, like, okay, we want to like 
you know, if, if this was a movie, this would be like a very quick montage of you sort of making it, going from a yeah. uh, young person in Netscape through HyperX, uh, you know, through like VMware, we're almost a CTO, kind of forwarding first VMware, right? I think where I first kind of heard of you was during the Accompli days. And so, sure. we just talked yeah. about... Yeah, could you just talk to us about Accompli and like, you know, uh, how that came about and what you guys are building and the story of that yeah. leading into Microsoft? So, so uh, uh, sure, the, the montage is this, basically from Netscape and through uh, uh, all the way to right before Accompli, I spent, um, I think it was maybe another five or seven years uh, working in technology and in infrastructure technology. So either as an engineer initially or later uh, as the founder of a company who started it because we had built a product I was really proud of and that company was uh, going out of business. So my, my, my colleagues and I you know, decided to buy it and started a company Hyperic and that's how we wound up at VMware. But after VMware, I was pretty spent, I guess, on the subject of infrastructure. I, I just kind of wasn't excited about it. And I got really cynical. Actually, that's the best word is cynical. I was at, at VMware for three years. And while it was a really good experience and I learned a ton, it proved to be incredibly, I refer to VMware during that time, at least for me as Microsoft junior high, because I was working <laughs> for uh, uh, Paul Moritz, who was a former Microsoft executive, uh, uh, and along with a whole bunch of other people who had had, uh, uh, you know, incredibly important roles at Microsoft and at other companies and even at Google. Uh, uh, and after going through that stage at VMware, I, I, I kind of wanted, I was like, okay, I want to do something else and, and uh, uh, went to spend some time at uh, Redpoint Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence and in the midst of, of doing, I think, the difficult work you know, when you're when you're uh, uh, successful, when you've been lucky enough to have started a company and have it work out, people, at least for me, think that I'm just some like that I have like the super cool notebook of awesome ideas that I can just draw from. They're like, well, surely you're going to do something next. And I'm like, mm -hmm. uh huh. And they're like, well, what's it going to be? I'm like, uh, not sure. Just uh, give me, you know, for, you know, I, I, I just I'm not. I'm very single threaded, I guess, in that respect. Like, I but it's actually very, one of the nerdiest shows yeah. we ever done. You know, single threaded. <laughs> we talk about Tannenbaum versus Linux. You know, like yeah, yeah know. this one for the faint <laughs> of heart. <laughs> so yeah, so single threaded. And look, I uh, uh, I just I I I knew that I wanted to build a, a product that was useful for businesses, but I had decided that I wanted to work on something that users had to choose. My, my, in, in the time, the first few months that I was, uh, uh, you know, at Redpoint, not coming up with ideas and sort of pacing and really meeting with a bunch of other people, uh, uh, trying to sort of get uh, uh, something going, I guess. I remember the only thing that I had managed to capture that, that I held on to was this idea that we had made a shift from a, a, an era where technology was very mysterious. Actually, this connects to the very, th the first thing we talked about, right? Like, and in, in the beginning, technology was powerful, but very difficult to understand and very difficult to put to use. So you needed specialized people mm -hmm. with specialized knowledge to help, you know, mere mortals kind of work with it and so forth. And over time, not only did technology become much more approachable and part of the common lexicon and just a part of everybody's life. But the important thing that I noticed was that it had become the subject of taste, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that there were now multiple options good options for just about every single technology need you could have. Um, and as a result, what really separated the alternatives was uh, uh, their way to, a, their, their path to appealing mm -hmm. to specific people and to having a point of view. And so that was kind of the big revelation. And, and I also remember this was in 2013, there was a lot of talk about uh, the uh, consumerization of IT. And so like everything in the media, whether it's working from home and we will never set foot in an office ever again, mm -hmm. or the fact that people were bringing Dropbox and using it for work or Google Docs or what have you, um, the, the way that this was interpreted and covered by the media at the time was about some kind of like massive shift where everything was gonna go a la carte and it was gonna be users would rule and IT was out of business and so on and so forth. And I looked at that 
And I was like, look, this is a bunch of shit. Like, there's no way this is going to happen this way. And partly because my... <laughs> there it is. Steven, you're not using the soundboard nearly enough. Um, the, uh, the It's a family show. I, it is. It before is you, I wanted to show. pick up... I'm sorry. I'm so, it's, I know, it's, I'm, I'm, I no, it's up, not. I, I want to pick up on something you said uh, that I PG-13. thought... thirteen. That was super interesting. Where Because I think it feeds into this, you know what you're, you know, where you're heading with, with IT and stuff, which is you said it was really important to have a point of view. Mm-hmm. So what do you really mean by that? I think that's a, a really important concept that I, I don't think we hear enough of. Yeah. So uh, it's not the solution to the problem. It's just as important how you approach it. It's kind of a generic statement. I, uh, I'll use the example with a comply just to bring it down to specific. So the story was, I'm like, look, I don't know what I'm going to build, but I know for sure that it's not, the world isn't going to go to all consumerization of IT. There will still be plenty of things IT provides you, but users have a very loud and powerful and important voice and they have lots of choices. So anything I choose to do, I'll need to think about exactly, it's a high bar to clear just because it's not an, if you build it, there will come. It just doesn't mm-hmm. work that way anymore. Not, at least not for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, may, it, it does work for some classes of products, but I just never... Right. Uh, and along the way, I'm also thinking, except Javier, you don't know anything about this. You're like a plumber, man. Like I consider <laughs> myself a pretty good plumber. And here I am talking about getting into interior design topics. Right. Uh, but, but by uh, the way, I would say if you're talking about building Outlook and Exchange and trying to figure out all the weirdness of that API and EWS, that you're definitely a plumber. Um, uh, you know. But that was part of it. And actually, of all the things that I contributed to the early builds of Accompli, I wrote the first back end. Um, I, I feel sorry was, for you. I, it, was, that, it was, yeah, it was. It that was, must have been a traumatic experience. Yeah, but going back to Stephen's question, like the, uh, uh, the question yeah. about the uh, point of view that you bring, this might be the most important uh, product lesson that I could have ever hoped to learn. And I learned it in a very uh, uh, unique set of circumstances. Basically, you have to decide for a very kind of grounded reality. In our case, it was mm-hmm. like, look, I, we identified an opportunity around mobile email. Um, Mailbox had just uh, launched. I, I'm assuming a lot of people on the call probably remember that. Fantastic product, very opinionated product for mobile email. Mailbox had this core opinion about like uh, uh, swipes. and swipe. They invented the swipe gesture. Yep. That, that and not amazing. only did they invent it, but Gentry and the team who are amazing uh, uh, product designers and amazing developers had to handcraft the 60 frame per second uh, uh, gently accelerating swipe Mm-hmm. That may, that now most iOS developers take for granted because it comes for free. They also uh, had with, the if I remember when you had this inbox zero that little exactly. like calm image background if I remember. Here and here comes the part about point of view. So that was their point of view, except that I don't live inbox zero style, and I'm super freaking fine with that. Uh, by the way, um, so I was using that product there for a bit and trying to. Fix figure out what people made such a big deal about it. And I never got the prize. I never got the Instagram thing. And so the revelation there was, uh, yeah, there's an important part about having opinions, but you got to have the right ones, right? And uh, uh, with all love and affection to Mailbox, it had picked some that turned out to be the right ones for a narrower set of people than would have been necessary to succeed in that category. Mm -hmm. And I saw that even though I didn't know jack squat about building swipes at 60 frames per second or what it really took to truly make something beautiful and and effective what i did know was that you had to actually with if you that there was an opportunity around mobile email because mobile email wasn't as great as it needed to be and that that mailbox at the time was 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 not it right and what the, the path of figuring out, what, well, what is it is actually maybe the most uh, lasting lesson for me because I've applied it now <laughs> a few more times. The question to ask is, you know, uh, what is the, the you know, in, in our case with email, what is mm-hmm. what is holding you back from being able to do more email for, on your phone? I wasn't trying to defend email. Like if you <laughs> if you're post email, well, that's great. Like the point was there was a sizable number of people who depend on right. email and actually depend on it on their phone. What holds you back from doing more right. email on your phone? And that you could ask that question in a room, let's say, with a thousand people, actually right here in, in our clubhouse gathering, and uh, uh, 
and and get three answers that everyone generally agrees with, right? Regardless of whether they're inbox zero mm -hmm. people or inbox a million. And those three answers formulated the opinionated point of view that led to a company. They were very straightforward. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first is, you know, typing is hard. The second mm -hmm. is search is hard because it requires typing. Um, and the third was app switching is hard. And these were three things. The first two guaranteed every time I asked in any setting, it was sort of like a, 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 a challenge almost. I would ask random people in any gathering. People would ask me what I was working on. I'd, I'd walk them through this. And there was just a remarkable consistency to that. And so we said, well, the product that solves that mm -hmm. is the right product. And in our case, our vision was a product that gets you the, uh, uh, only one action away from the task uh, right. from what is necessary to deal with the message. Right? So, so let me ask you something spicy. So, and this might be like a tangent, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're talking about like a few years ago, you know, and, yeah. but I just want to jump off on the email topic to 2021. Right. Yeah. I mean, no one, I think no one in this audience is going to wake up tomorrow and say, man, I just wish I got more email today. Right. You know, uh, at this point of all the amazing product work that I think has gone into email for decades. And I'm just curious about, and of course you have probably have a point of view just given the role you occupy, but you know, this 2021 state of email, we have seen, um, you know, companies like superhuman, uh, you know, full disclosure, which is kind of a portfolio company at the, firm we work in, uh, we have seen Hey, which kind of has another opinionated take. Uh, we've seen like a bunch of different opinionated takes. We've seen a lot of people like move stuff off of email to Slack. You know, do you have like a wish list of, and you know, hey, this is what I would love to see in an email client that nobody has built just yet. And please, uh, please tell us the schedule of release of those yeah. features as well. Yeah. <laughs> also, which color icon you're going to use and how I can tell it apart from all the other icons. Well, listen, I, I'll start by saying fewer email is better email. How about that? Like, that's actually. Uh, uh, now you're just email. pandering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's just a populist uh, okay. comment. You just want to, like, you know, get our room count number up. No, 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 no. Actually, <laughs> I, I've spent enough time uh, uh, thinking about this. I can tell you that uh, uh, there's that email um, for, for a range of technical and just product design reasons will be with us for a very long time. And can you. Can you make it better? It turns out that actually the things that people uh, hate about email are also the things that make it great and unique and impossible to replace, mm -hmm. right? Got it. It's, yeah. it's fundamentally open, right? Uh, it is, it accumulates uh, um, and it, it actually supports uh, uh, payloads, right? Like you can use it to carry stuff around. And mm -hmm. those three things, are both the best and the worst aspects of it. And, and I think there's uh, uh, like in many, in any other category in technology, amp, a, a whole bunch of stuff that, that can be done to improve it. Not the least of which is honestly to, to teach people when it's, the, when it's the right tool, which is actually a big always, part of- the, Always the, the right tool to send more email. Well, you know, uh, um, we presence is an important part of a, a collaborative experience, right? Like me just swarming your chat program of choice, uh, uh, whether it's Slack or, or any other with messages while you're not able to answer them or respond to them or catch up to them uh, in a product that is actually not designed necessarily for uh, accumulation and queuing of work is not right. a great favor, right? Uh, right. Um, and instead, you know, being able to tell you, hey, uh, uh, as we do with Google Chat, like, Hey, Javier, this is outside of his working hours, or he's currently in a meeting. Uh, maybe you should actually, uh, you know, send him an email. It's uh, the outside of email. The 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 equivalent, maybe parallel example of this is people who text you and say that what you unexpectedly. If you're texting someone saying, "Hey, uh, uh, Stephen, it's Javier. We met yesterday." Uh, 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 if you have to introduce yourself when you first text somebody. Um, it, it might mean that they're not expecting that text and therefore you probably are doing it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that to me is an illustration of the fact that the person on the other end of the interaction isn't expecting to hear from you or at least have you buzz their pocket in maybe a more intrusive way than email would. And so, yeah, it's, there, there's ways to actually make all, of, all communication products, including email more effectively and that they don't always imply, you know, throw more volume into it. So, uh, let, sorry, let, me jump in. let me jump in. So you're, you're in a position now 
where um, where you have a chance to impact email quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe what we should what we could do is talk some about about this transition you made from building this very successful mail client mm -hmm. that got that sort of put Microsoft back in the mobile game to you know now you're managing not just email but all of the tools around email um, with uh, Google um, Meet Place Google Hangout Place What's Work, the name of it? Workspace <laughs> Workspace forgot. Workspace Come on Stay with Workplace No with Google Workplace Workplace Space Workspace and, and um, it's a space where you work, Steven. He does I got it. I got it. I'm done making office. my joke. Clear on, yeah. You took my icon joke and you used it twice. So I had to use this one. But in, in all seriousness, <laughs> I think this idea, carrying forth this idea of point of view on, yes. on not just email now, but now you you have all of these tools that you, that you are orchestrating into a yep. sort of a modern a modern point of view on work. So where where is is that heading? Well, I'd, I'd start by saying that in my entire time at Microsoft, and I had a really, really good experience there. It was actually, I learned a ton. I got to work on some products that, that uh, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, it was just like everything I could have ever hoped for. And the irony of having landed there, having started my career at Microsoft and then getting, this is why I think your your uh, newsletters and your and your write-ups of uh, your time there are so, so special. Like, um, being able to be a part of that in any way was really special. Now, one while I was there, one of the things that I actually pointed out, and I'm sure there, there's probably people, hopefully there are people who worked with me and uh, who I got to know at Microsoft listening now. Um, I People knew about how strongly I felt about the subject of opinionated product design and how in many cases at Microsoft, we they've lost the thread on that. And I always admired. And, and what do you mean by that, uh, Javier? What is opinionated product design for folks? That I don't mean, know? it's it's basically in taking a product like email or any kind mm -hmm. of uh, a broadly used horizontal thing. Mm -hmm. And instead of actually bringing a point of view around what its primary purpose is, what its overall control, what its core user journeys are. Mm -hmm. You just say, well, here's a truckload of buttons. Mm -hmm. We're going to do our best to organize them. And I'm, I'm like, by being very uh, uh, provocative in how I'm describing this. Yeah, right. the, uh, this show is all about being provocative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's something to be said about when you are the person or when you're the organization that defines or scales a category, mm -hmm. it takes incredible discipline to ride that wave and preserve a sense of point of view around the design of the product without having your users potentially pull you into a trillion different directions. In the case of Microsoft, what I've come to understand is that it's the time at which it was actually scaling was still at a time when people didn't have such a sense of taste and opinion about technology, right? Mm -hmm. They were learning uh, along the way. And I think Steven, your, your uh, uh, stories chronicle that in an awesome way. It's true. like. Uh, uh, the people at Microsoft were inventing the future and the people who were consuming these products were just trying to figure shit out. Like it was, it was just very, very dynamic. Now people have a much better sense of what, what they expect to see, the level of polish they want to see from products, the level of complexity they're willing to tolerate. And somewhere within that in any given space, whether it's email, document authoring, mm -hmm. or what have you, you have a core set of uh, uh, opinions that should formulate the path you take to building and bringing your yeah. product to market and having mm -hmm. it stand out. And so if you look at something like Google Workspace across the board with Google Docs, what are the opinions of Google Docs? Well, the first one is there are no files, only links, mm -hmm. right? right? Um, and and you, you talk to somebody who's grown up using just those products about a, a sending attachments or enclosures as Bill Gates, apparently the only person in the world who refers to them uh, as enclosures, uh, uh, Stephen, do you call them enclosures? They're, they're attachments, right? You're with I, me on this? I, why don't we talk about that? Send me a schedule plus and we can talk about uh, that. I, I, I went, <laughs> to, I went to see him send me an S plus and he laughed so much. Yeah, we, we can we can do this entire meeting in like old school Microsoft lingo, which by the way, I became really good at. at, at, at people thought I had worked there back when Stephen was still there because uh, I could drop <laughs> some references. This is the junior high part. But anyway, you can... <laughs> You, you can see you could see those opinions at Google. Gmail has different opinions than Outlook. And so I I always thought Google had brought opinionated product design uh, to life in these products. And it was it made them uniquely appealing, even if people didn't know that that's why they picked them. Right. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the qualities about you landing an opinion, especially in, mm -hmm. in a product that is used by, in the case of uh, Google Workspace, like 2.7 billion people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for people to just gracefully use the product without even mm -hmm. noticing that, is is a testament to getting a bunch of stuff right and so that part is the 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 attraction and, and then the task of evolving opinions is difficult it's not right. just that you can have them and like you're good right. uh how you you know so i just you are one of the few people you know really shaping how people work across the industry and i want to kind of get into like a very specific like product type question which sure. is around us having multiple inboxes and how we think about like attention across them. So for example, I think for a, a, a generic, a, a person in the tech industry today, a knowledge worker, they are probably handling email, uh, an email service that, you know, almost surely, you know, under mm -hmm. your purview, they're definitely in Google Docs, which has its own set of comments. Uh, they're probably in a messaging software. They're probably like, you know, sending a text using uh, uh, Google Chat. Uh, they're probably on Slack, which has its own inbox and getting notifications mm -hmm. from there. They're probably getting text messages. They're probably on Signal or uh, WhatsApp. They're probably on Figma and they're getting comments in there. You know, and it seems like there are so many inboxes and you're trying to route and trying to find out how do I get somebody's attention? What is the social etiquette for messaging somebody? How do yep. I, you know, how would you just think about all of this? Because you folks obviously play a large part in some of these inboxes, some of these which you don't own. How do you just think about this problem? So the first, I can tell you that the wrong place to start is thinking in terms of gr a grand unified theory of everything, right? Like a unified inbox, for example, is an interesting idea, but ultimately I think it doesn't, like unifying all those services uh, uh, and all those modalities into one single place is maybe well motivated, but you have to have that. That's actually almost a technical solution, not a product opinion. So here's the product right. opinions. For, for for Google Workspace. Here's here's the here's what if you ask me, like uh, um, especially now as we uh, uh, optimistically are going to start seeing over the course of this year a, ret a some type of return to office mode, right? Which uh, in whatever form it takes. So what have we learned? We've learned three things that are the basis for our our vision of communication and productivity. First of all, that work has officially been dis disconnected from uh, the location that it actually it normally takes place in. Um, and by that, I mean work, whether it's work in the term in terms of a job or work as a student, uh, uh, what you do and where it happens is no longer, you know, inextricably linked. That was true before the pandemic, but it's now true in a way that the entire planet in one way or another has experienced it. Um, and so it's no longer just, a, oh, hey, I need to work from home on Tuesday because I have a dentist appointment, right? Um, so that's the first one. The second one is as a result of the disconnection between work and where it takes place, the subject of managing your time and your attention becomes that much more critical because you can't be in two places at the same time because you now have, as we've all witnessed in different ways, competing demands and you want to do you know, your best as a parent, as a caregiver, as a friend, and as a, an employee or a, a student or whatever you do. And it's just really hard and there are no shortage as you uh, enumerated of technology products demanding our attention notifications you get all of that and so managing your time and your attention is 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 the critical skill right uh, there will always be new tools and, and all of that and then the third one uh, which is the hardest one to crack in my opinion is the subject of uh, human connection so every single thing we do uh, every single let's say difficult and worthy endeavor that we take on as human beings, whether it's teaching a, a young kid how to read or how to la landing a spacecraft on, on, a, on a different planet, requires humans to not only get together and do a lot of math, but also to, to believe and to establish a sense of trust and possibility that we all got to stop and admit is impossible. Uh, Google Meet is awesome. It is not the most effective vehicle for human connection not today yet anyway right <laughs> and neither is zoom or teams or any of the number of pro like living and interacting with humans over a two-dimensional piece of glass is a soul-sucking experience and, mm -hmm. and and it's fine we should just be okay with that right like 
that it, it's effective, it works, but does it actually help us connect? No, it most certainly does not, right? Uh, um, jamming more people into a screen doesn't do it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the answer is still, you know, ahead of us, right? Yes. So with those three things in mind, then you can start actually thinking about like, what, how do you put that into practice, into products? And that's kind of how we think about it. Um, well, okay, I, I, I love that, uh, you know, but, uh, but I can admit, I think all of us, we've spoken in previous episodes about having, you know, a Google Meet slash Zoom fatigue. And so, you know, I, I think you'll find a lot of support over here. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I think the pandemic, you know, we kind of really stretched the limits of that. Okay, I think one couple of last questions. And one of the things that's really fascinating about you is you kind of seen both sides of startups and big companies. You've founded a startup, you've worked at a startup, you sold a startup to a big company, and you now lead a really large organization. And for a lot of people, I think one question we get for either somebody early in their career or, you know, kind of like say, you know, like a deacon in the career is how should they think about joining a startup versus joining a large company? Now, of course, if someone had a choice, they should come work at Google. Let's just call <laughs> it out. Right. Uh, but outside of that, you know, having seen both sides of that, like how, how do you uh, help somebody make that choice? I uh, uh, listen, I think. When I think about my first company out of school, it was such a unique thing because Netscape was neither a startup nor a big established company. And that, if I could, if I could point at other companies that were in 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 exactly that stage, I would say go there, right? Because you want to be at a place that is still uh, uh, hungry and uh, uh, growing fast and 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 doing a certain set of things well, but it's still clumsy and kind of uh, 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 learning the ropes, it, the opportunity to experience failure, bad decision making and good decision making in a in a smaller context, like you'd get in a company that at Netscape was probably two, 3000 people when I joined. VMware was in a similar state actually during the time that I was there. It grew very quickly during that period, but you're in there and you could see that not everything is working perfectly, right? And that the company doesn't have this kind of evergreen like proof of existence where it can make a trillion mistakes and still be around for another 40 years. Um, that really helped. Um, that was my experience. And then going into smaller companies, because a lot of what I have found most instructive, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the sheer number of mistakes I've either witnessed or made along the way that have actually, because I hope try to pay attention, right? Like make sure that you apply them correctly the next go around. And, and I, so in that sense, I think it's not so much a big company versus a small company or startup because at a startup, you're bound to see lots and lots of mistakes. And you know what, you might get lucky and the experience is uh, uh, unlike anything else because it's very, uh, it's very emotional. It's like a relationship. It's not a rational decision. It's not, I mean, done it, doing it right and joining a startup and being all empirical about it and, and, and asking the founders to show you their cap table and explain their preferences and all this other stuff. Like if you're not actually really, really just drawn to the whole thing and you, you feel like there's something incredible happening there and the people and the space they're working on, then don't bother, right? Like uh, uh, it's risky, uncertain. That's, mm -hmm. that's how it should be. And, I, 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 I yeah. love that. Uh, uh, by the way, I love the sort of, uh, uh, it's kind of hard to remember back then, but I think that that messy mid space, uh, I think it's such a great uh, space to go in. Um, okay, one last thing, because before we wrap, I want to kind of take this full circle back. You talked about your childhood in Puerto Rico. You know, mm -hmm. Stephen is talking about how you know, you've kind of been involved there. Like, how are you, you know, how do you think about, you know, Puerto Rico and, you know, how are you involved there today? So I am uh, involved in a couple of nonprofit organizations there uh, uh, in advisory capacities in one and as a board member in another. And uh, my family lives there. What I've seen actually, particularly over maybe the last uh, five years uh, happening in Puerto Rico as uh, uh, Puerto Rico has endured a tremendous amount of uh, uh, you know, hardship, economic hardship. We had a hurricane, I mean, earthquakes. It's really been uh, a tough time. How uh, young people in particular, and even people coming from outside the island going over there have really applied entrepreneurship as a path to getting the island to recreate its economy, to create new opportunity, and actually in some cases, create opportunity for companies catering 
not even to the local Puerto Rican market, but actually having uh, uh, scope and impact well outside of it. So it's been a very cool thing to witness. It's very much a work in progress, but there's really, really, really good talent there. Technical talent, creative talent, design talent, product talent all around. Mm -hmm. And it's a really special place. Sadly, I haven't been back there in, uh, in you know, well over a year for reasons I'm sure everyone who's listening can, can attest to. But uh, I definitely, uh, I'm excited about, you know, the work that's happening there and remaining connected there in any way I can. Certainly Twitter, hopefully there's some Boricuas listening today uh, <laughs> uh, uh, here. Uh, I'm counting on it, actually. Uh, uh, we're everywhere, man. So I, I, uh, I'm sure there are there are there are more than a few. Oh, I'm sure there's more than a few. And and, and by the way, there's so many good tweets about even just the last hour. Um, okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, so, so let me kind of quickly, you know, wrap this. Of course, you know, everyone who uh, listened in, uh, I see Paul there hanging out in the audience. Uh, uh, you jump in. Thank you so much. This is such a fun conversation. I know a lot of folks have been asking for some of the themes that we covered today. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all the tweets and uh, DMs and the Google icon jokes. Um, next time, we're going to have Javier back and we're going to ask him blindly, you know, which combination of yellow, white, and red is which app. And, uh, I love it. I'll take it. I'll take it. And actually, uh, uh, I invite everyone else to come uh, come join me on, uh, on on another rebrand effort for any other high scale product. You can trade that. Well, there's a whole super fun. There's a whole subreddit on the icons where they're trying to figure them out. So we should People just have a lot yeah. of time head over on there. Your hands. That's all I gotta say. Yeah. Uh, okay. How many, okay. Okay. You know what? I have to ask. It since you brought this up, right? How many Google messaging apps exist, and what should I use for which use case? Ah, you want to close on that? <laughs> I don't actually, the first part of the question I can't answer. I, I'm actually contractually prohibited from answering that. Uh, 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 the second part of the answer is actually, if you're using it at work, you should use Google Chat. Um, and if you're using a Android phone, you should use Google Messages. It's Android Messages is awesome with the RCS work we're doing mm -hmm. is uh, bringing iMessage-like functionality along with security and all the other good things uh, to the Android ecosystem. Uh, so yeah, I'd say use, use those two. Uh, there you go. Uh, now, uh, 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 it, it, thanks for it. it see, you know, that was not so hard. That was super no, easy. No, it, it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. I, uh, I'm with you. It's, uh, it, it's not so hard. So I'm glad you noticed. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I really like that because every time I'm going to one of your blog posts, I mean, it seems so complicated. This is so much easier. Okay. Anyway, so on that note, <laughs> you know, uh, si since we have clarity, uh, by the way, you're going to see a huge usage bump tomorrow, Javier, in you know, both Google <laughs> messages. So your PR team should be just really thankful for the show. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know, we thank our listeners. And first of all, a huge shout out to, you know, Steven for making this happen for, uh, 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 you know, and for changing his icon and for helping prep. Uh, Steve, it's just so much fun. And for all the old Microsoft uh, lingo, uh, Javier, we'll definitely send you an S plus for a future episode. And mostly Javier for just being an amazing guest. You know, I think I've followed your work for many, many years. I've used Accompli. I used it when it switched to Microsoft Outlook. I changed the swipe directions in the settings every single time. Uh, you know, <laughs> it had the best, it had the best calendar integration, I would say, insert an email app, which is killer. I just love uh, that. That was the first core opinion that we had. So you asked about opinion. You 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 you're soaking in all the examples, right? There. I I, I love it. Uh, we just you know just love your story and love obviously what you're doing for uh, Puerto Rico. So uh, thank you so so much. And you know we'll have you back here next time where you can explain all the Google messaging apps in detail. Uh, I love it. No, I love it. <laughs> uh, so we have a tradition here uh, where we try and pick. Avi, I had nothing to do with this. So whatever he's going to play, I had no say in it. And so <laughs> Uh, I have a song that I'm going to play, but he he's overriding me. So yeah, I, uh, I apologize in advance. I'm making an executive edition. So we pick a song based on the speaker or the theme of the episode that we, you know, and I think uh, it's going to be very obvious, you know, why we have picked this song. So Javier, thank you so much. And to play us out. <laughs> thank uh, you all. Play me out. Let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, here's uh, Rihanna with Work, Work, Work. <laughs> I was going to play Live in La Vida Loca, just for the record. <laughs> well, that's a good one, too. <laughs>